Without any further ado, we're going to listen to Peter Todd talk about what makes Bitcoin so special. There is a lot of misinformation going on out there, and you may have heard of blockchain a lot, but not every blockchain is the same blockchain. So Peter Todd is going to talk about what's important with Bitcoin's blockchain and why you should pay attention to that, because that has the longest term potential. Because it benefits everyone as a whole on the globe, it doesn't just benefit a certain group of people. So. Thanks so much for coming here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Of course, I think for my answer, it's probably going to be Bitcoin blockchain, which is a really boring thing that doesn't really have much to it and kind of works. Good. So, I think maybe a good way to start is to ask I mean, what do you guys actually know about crypto? I mean, do, do you guys think you know what a hash function is? If you're nodding. Go ahead and try it to explain to everyone what it is. If you're comfortable <laughs> enough, tell Peter what a hash function is. Go for it. A hash function takes an input of um, any number of characters or strings and hashes it, hashes, it, hashes it according to some algorithm, depending on which hash function, into an output of a fixed number of bytes. All right, so what's special about that? What is special about it? If it's a proper hash function, you cannot take the output and find the input. Okay. But I mean, depending on what kind of hash function we're talking about. I could have a hash function then that's for every input just says hello. Yeah, you could. The Sorry. output of the hash function will be unique to pretty much most of the well, there are some interlocks, but you can pretty much, if you change the inputs by just one character, the output will be. But if the output is smaller than input, how can it be possibly unique? Uh, That's not unique. But there are so many possibilities that the chances of having two given inputs to them. Producing the same output is uh, extremely low. So it's not actually unique. But it's just hard to find when it is when it doesn't work. Oh, the hash functions are deterministic. Well, so I think what we have is a reasonable definition here, which is to say we have some function which we'll call H. It takes a message M and produces a digest of D. How the blue one or the red one work? Correction, one of those things. <laughs> Right. So, what's interesting about it is if I take, we'll call that M1, M2, M2, D2. So, the interesting thing about the hash function is, like you said, it happens to be very, very difficult to go find two messages with the same digest. And because of that, well, you can say that the output, the digest, commits the input. You know, and that if I give you a digest, right, it's infeasible for me to find a different message with the same digest. Thus, when I later on give you the message, you know that I gave you the original message I meant in the first place. All right? And you actually see this on Twitter a lot, where people, including me, we're going to do things like tweet out shot two six hashes. And what we're really saying is, well, I have this secret message. I'm not going to tell you yet, but I'm going to be all ha-ha. You know, I already know the answer to this. Now you go find the answer. And later on, I can reveal, well, I was actually right all along, for instance. Or it could be something a little more boring, like you're trying to download the latest completely legal movie which you are allowed to copy. And you get a small BitTorrent file, you know, the seed as they call it, and then your computer goes and grabs the rest of it from other computers. Well, how do you know the other computers gave you the completely legal to download the movie rather than something else? Well, because it was all hashed. You know, those other computers gave you data that then you hash and you find what well, matches what I wanted to get in the first place. And BitTorrent, interestingly, under the hood, it uses something called Merkle tree. So yeah, this is like your BitTorrent 
see you. And long story short, there's a whole bunch of operations <coughs> that lead up to it. I apparently can't draw more of the trees. <laughs> I actually did this like more than once or twice a year. I might be able to do this right. <laughs> but, well, what do those arrows mean? Well, in our notation, you know, whenever we do this, what we actually say is M2 goes to D2. You know, and you see this in diagrams all the time. They're, they're just saying, we had something, we hashed it, and we had something else. Sometimes you'll see the arrows go, um, go the other way. That's because the you know, author there is incompetent and doesn't know what they're doing. So in BitTorrent, all these, you know, the bottom here, you get chunks of data. All right, that's like, you know, 64 kilobytes worth of your movie. All right, another 64. And we take this and we hash that, you know, hash that big chunk. And now we have digest one, digest two, right? And then we hash those two digests is concatenated. Now here's the question. I mean, why is it that in this scheme I can't change any of the movie? All right, why, why, why with all these intermediate steps is that property still hold true? Change. Uh... Just a little tiny bit of anything, the vertical tree of uh, salt. Okay, yeah, so I changed this first bit. Well, does that change? That change? Now, does that change? That change? Et cetera, et cetera. Right? It goes right up the tree. Interestingly, as far as I know, like at a really deep mathematical level, no one's actually proven any of this is true. I mean, hash functions in general, they're kind of different than a lot of cryptography because. There are no math proofs that they actually work. You know, there's kind of assumptions that if I know it seems hard, no one's figured out how to go reverse a hash, so we're gonna assume they work. Kind of a shaky assumption, but I know it's lasted pretty well for probably a good 15 years or so. We went from uh, shop to about two to six. I guess it works, it seems to work. But yeah, technically speaking, all this stuff's kind of up in there. But from your point of view, you can assume this is true. All right, so we have, so from our point of view, we have this Merkle tree. But we can actually do something even simpler, which is what if we, like, have blocks? Okay. What if we, we'll call that B0? Your mark is also. Yeah, <laughs> well, what if we said that a block contains the hash of the previous block? Right? That means that we can draw these arrows again. You know, when you have this block, it committed to that block. When you have that block, it committed to that block. Right? So just like in an earlier example, if I change this block in any way, that's going to force this block to change. Well, now this means that again, if you and I can agree on what this block is, then every prior block we can agree on as well. Right? Let's suppose you think, you know, this block has digests one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D. Well, when you, your computer asks other computers for the data that leads up to that, you can verify that the data is actually match. <laughs> so, you know, it, it hashes in sequence just like the movie example, and you want the same thing. But what's interesting about this is it happens to be quite easy to then add more data, right? Like, let's suppose later on we decide we're going to upgrade. We're going 
So because this is a chain, it's easy to add things to. It works. This one I promise. Really well. Oh, that, that, that looks solid. <laughs> yeah, one of the hardest problems in computer science is getting markers that actually work. <laughs> That's not a computer science book. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's, it, it's a common with a lot of things, much the same way as computer science is used in many disciplines. Markers are also used in many disciplines. <laughs> Right, so but because we had a chain, and because we just save the digest, it's easy to keep on adding new things. Right? And this is useful because, well, what are you going to do with the block chain? Just sit at it, look at it. No, you want to be using something. You know, you want to add things to it. So because it's a linear chain, it's easy to go add things. The other implication of this, which is more subtle, is the only way to know what you actually have is to go and re-verify step by step. And I'll go touch on that more later. But you know, it forces you to use the blockchain in a certain way. And for Bitcoin, well, what it actually does is these blocks, rather than just being blocks of data, well, they're actually split into a block header and then the block itself. And the header contains. I can't read that question. I can't read that question. Wait, what does it say again? Merkle root. Okay, Right? So the Merkle root is just the digest of the tip of some big Merkle tree. And the Merkle tree contains transactions. And what is a transaction? All those bunch of indicators. Right? From this, from what I've shown here, transactions just a lot of data. And now we have a system where a bunch of blocks. Within the blocks contains more data, and the data is ordered. Because right? you can create a consistent rule. You can go say that well, if I have a transaction, you know, zero to transaction n, I know what order the transaction is because the Merkle tree has a certain shape. And the shape is the same for everyone. You know, your your transaction zero is my transaction zero. So we're so you know we can agree on that word, and it's notable that this wouldn't work if hash functions had the property that if I go hash, you know, digest zero, digest one, right? That's a different output than hashing digest one and digest zero in a different order. Some proposed hash functions don't have this property. The ones we use do. So now, so again, we have a set of blocks, they all have transactions, we have a set of transactions. And the transactions are ordered. So now what we can agree on is, well, what is the complete set of all transactions that have ever happened, and what order they're in. So what this really means is Bitcoin is actually a set of transactions, right? Transaction zero to transaction, I think right now, 50 million. Someone should look this up. How many Bitcoin transactions are there? I think it's on the order of like 50 million, 100 million. You know, it's, in the, it's in the tens of millions. It's very big. And we, since we know on the order, well, now we can say, well, let's just process the transactions one after another. And if the transaction moves money around, well, Obviously, you want the state of the money to match what the transaction is doing with it, right? Because the transaction could say something like, all right, Alice has Bitcoin. Alice is going to go give that Bitcoin to Bob. Another transaction later on says, well, Alice would like to go give a Bitcoin to Charlie. That transaction should get rejected because Alice no longer has a Bitcoin. You know, the transaction itself is valid in the sense that it came from Alice. Alice made that claim, but it can't happen because there isn't anyone. You know, and also another way to think of it is like a check. 
right? When, when you write a check, that piece of paper you're writing can be authenticated as valid. If it came from you, it's real. But whether or not the check itself has any meaning depends on whether or not there's any money in your bank account. If there's no money in your bank account, the check's not valid, even though it's, you know, it's real. So if we have transactions, I mean, what are we going to put in there? <laughs> well, because uh, all Bitcoin transactions are uh, well, no. all Bitcoin transactions are a series of inputs, or a series of creating a series of outputs that are then become inputs into a transaction. Okay. So, <laughs> let's say our transaction is a wallet data. That wallet data refers to. Something. So you're going to call that the inputs. And we're going to have outputs. Okay, we'll uh, cut that up and make each one of these an output. <coughs> so, what are these inputs referring to exactly? The input would be um, transaction, previous transaction, from another. Alright, so maybe I have a another transaction. And it has say two outputs. And this one refers to that particular output. Alright? Sorry, so we have actually here the previous transaction or previous state of the address that sent the transaction. Interesting question. I mean when you write a check, what's actually in the check? I mean the check names a person, not a particular coin they own. But it sounds like a Bitcoin might work a little differently. Well, I mean, here's an interesting question. If you had a check and then you create a different check, how do you figure out which of those checks wound up taking the money? Right? Like, well, I mean, you think about it, you can't. Well, I'm saying, like, with a check, right? On um, the check itself, it says, you know, Peter Todd. Pays the order of Alice, you know, hundred dollars. If I have a different check, it says pays the order of Charlie, another hundred bucks. Well, which which check is valid if I have hundred dollars? The first one. Right, so it's actually based on timing. I mean, and this is interesting. Actually, not the first check. The first one was deposited. Yeah, and this is interesting thing with checks, you can't like you can't say which one happens first, right? Because my money is just this blob of money. And all checks just say, well, take this money and withdraw something. And it seems to be okay for checks. I mean, normally we just don't care. We have enough money to cover our expenses. But if you try to do something really complex, you might want to actually go say, well, this check is only valid if this check giving me money is deposited. Right? Because what happens if that check giving me money doesn't actually happen? You know, what if I want to go write a check that says, well, I'm going to give you 100 bucks, but only if he gives me 100 you know, potentially could be nicer that way. Currently, I can't do that. Currently, that hundred bucks is always going to go to him, even if he didn't go pay me. Which might be unfortunate because I might have meant to go pay you first. You know, because you're going to get my hundred bucks no matter what. He only gets my hundred bucks that I get paid. And in Bitcoin, long story short, it's designed to let you make that distinction. You can go say, I'm going to move this money if and only if this other money moves as well. So, in fact, in Bitcoin, the ordering of transactions is kind of independent of blockchain, right? Because the transactions themselves say what order they can be. And that's why, to get back to our point, each input right, refers to a specific token. So then what else might be in the transaction? Addresses to which this input is going to go. 
All right, so you're really saying an output will have an address in it. Ah, well that's important. All right, so who here knows the digital signatures? All right, let's go on the sort of to see if they can answer. Okay, so uh, the signature is uh, ability to provide information that I own private key without revealing the private key itself. And that is done through a prolific curve for maps. Actually, the digital the signature, signature is validating your personality yeah. or your identity. Keys is just a means to validate it. You is you. Because there are other ways that digital signature can validate you know, but just for the public and personal. You're writing like in a new system to make digital cash flow. Why do you care about human beings? I mean, what if I want to write Bitcoin for hyper intelligent AIs that are going to take over the world and enslave all of humanity? You know, why would I tie my public key notion to human identity? I mean, I care about the robots. That's why I said it's not the keys. It's just for it is who is the, the identity of the, of the person in this case of something that's initiated or perceived or validated in this transaction. All right, but again, why are we why are we putting humans into this? Like I said it's not human. It's something. Something. I mean, why don't we just stick with this? It's maybe two computers. When two computers talk to each other, or routers, right? Why don't we just stick to a simple definition? Why don't we go say that we have a private key? It's called K, right? And when I say private, all that means is that bit of data, you know, that number, no one else should know it. Or put another way, anyone who does know it is able to do the thing that makes it happen. Well, what do you do with the key? Well, you go derive uh, a public key from it, P. All right? So, I have P, and it's associated with K. And the way it's associated is that I can take a message, M, all right, and I can sign that message with K and produce a signature. Now, admittedly, somewhere in the cryptographic math, there's sta you know, somewhat standardized letters could use for all this, but uh, I looked at the papers and also need to use somewhat different lettering, so it is what it is. But from our point of view, we're going to say that P. P is K, public key is P, and the SIG is also we're just going to type in SIG. And that by itself is very useful. What we can do is we can do verify, take public key, the message, and the sig, and verify whether well, it returns true or false. Right? Verification succeeds, it's true, fails, it's false. Well, when does it succeed? When the mathematical thing happens to occur that whoever did this had K. Right. So without private key, I cannot create a signature. With private key, I can. And in reality, Bitcoin actually uses something more complex than that, which I get into in a minute. But from our simple point of view, that would be enough. Right. You know, we have this magical primitive that says we have the ability to assign a message. And if I change the message, verification will fail. And if I change the key, verification. Well, will it fail? Does it actually matter? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. But we certainly want changing the message to make a verification fail or changing the you know. <coughs> And this means the outputs, well, what should they have? Well, we're going to have puppies, right? And on the inputs, that means these are all right, sig signatures. One signature per input. We can quibble about the details of the letter, but 
basically it says this signature made the claim that I wanted this to happen using this set of inputs. Now we can to draw the rest of this. And point it to another input, another transaction, and another transaction. Yeah, so an example might be I want to pay one Bitcoin to Alice. One Bitcoin to Bob. Another Bitcoin to Charlie. And I take that from you know, 0 0.5 Bitcoin, 0 0.5, and 1, and 1. I take that as three. So, I mean, what what would the rules be make to verify this? I mean, what would be an example of a transaction that would be kind of useless? I mean, what if what if this was half a Bitcoin, right? Would you want that transaction? But would should that transaction be valid? No, because the amount of the inputs should uh, should be exactly the same as the amount of the outputs plus the quantity. Alright, so let's let's have some rules here. Rule rule zero. This sounds like an important one. Dollar in has to be dollar out. And you said equal. Plus the coin base. Oh, no, we don't have coin base in here. We're just saying okay. Yeah, trend that's the, yeah. Well, so that's an interesting question. Why wouldn't you want people to be able to sign a transaction that We're took money and just destroyed it? I mean, does it matter? My point is better over here, not my problem. Unless it's your transaction. Well, I'm not an idiot, is what I would like to think, so I'll never make that mistake. <laughs> so it'd be reasonable for the rule to be less than or equal, right? And in fact, that's what Bitcoin's rule is, though, for a slightly different reason. And what other rules might you want to add? Yeah, Alright, so you're going to say rule number one. Every city is valid. <clears throat> Seems reasonable. So, yeah. Simon here is a port of people who should make those options if we have the house with the greatest convention. Well, I mean, when we say every signature is valid, I mean, under the hood, what does valid mean? We probably <coughs> mean that the hashes. When you know concatenating in a certain way with all these part keys and so on happens to be true, and I can tell you under the hood, essentially what Bitcoin actually does is it takes you know this data that represents this, gets rid of the signatures, hashes it all, and then validates the signature on that. You know it's a bit more complex than validate, but from a high level point of view, that's basically what it is. You know, take the transaction, remove the signatures from it, hash it up. And then use that as your message that you're signing with. So interesting question is, well, why does it move remove the signatures first? But the full ownership, the full the, the possible sending me it's going to actually owns it. Actually owns it. Now what do we mean by ownership? Uh, they received it in the hospital. Okay, so when, you say, when we say ownership, why don't we just say ownership always means possession of a private key, all right? But the question I asked was, why would Bitcoin remove these signatures first before hashing it and feeding that into the... Well, we really want to store a signature in the envelope. Because we need the signatures to verify them. Well, they were even very... Well, I mean, we have the signatures to verify. All right, let's go ask a different question. If the hash function, you know, if, the, if the message that we signed with included the signatures, 
doesn't that mean that we're signing with something that doesn't exist yet? Right? Because when I sign, I take a message. I sign with a key, and I produce a signature. How can I sign if I don't know what this is? Yeah, so actually, it's just a simple impossibility. These signatures, when the transaction is signed, are not known. So, Bitcoin's algorithm under the hood removes the signatures when it does verification, because that's actually the conditions at which the sender created the transaction. You know, that's what they knew when they did that. If, if you required this, you'd essentially be asking for time machine. signature is valid. What else? Could, I don't know if the phone actually does this, but you could actually check the address that's are valid. Oh, what would valid be? Um, um, I don't know if the phone actually does this, but you could remember, like, the way the math works is a public key is essentially just a number. There's a bit of nuance that statement, but effectively it is just a number. You know, what would you check? I mean, it's just a number. It could be in pretty much any range. You know, you could go check one or two minor unimportant things, but essentially, Bitcoin doesn't know anything about humans, doesn't know about people, so it has no idea what a valid book is. 